Please remain standing for the reading of the gospel. Before we get to the scripture, I want to say thank you to Reverend Porter for the opportunity to be with you today giving the word. I do not take this lightly, and it is always a joy and an honor. Before I get into this, I just want to say that today's scripture and today's message is on encountering others and community. And it doesn't pass me by that Reverend Porter has encountered me Time and time again, the first day that I moved here, my car broke down, and he said, I'm always your first call. And so I just have a lot of gratitude for his mentorship and the way that he leads us here at Smyrna First. Thank you, Reverend. Matthew 25, 34 through 46. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you who are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. These are the words of God for the people of God. God. You may be seated. Well, we are on week three of a series, The Road to Resilience. At 845, I accidentally called it The Road to Resistance. (laughs) I stand corrected. We should not be resisting God, but we do. (laughs) This is The Road to Resilience. So just a summary for those of you who might be new here or who might need a refresher. On week one of this series, we talked about waking up to God. We wake up to God through vision. We seek God and help one another to be loved and connected. Week two, which was last week, we learned a word called Shabbat. It means stop. So stop make margin in your life, say yes to God, and look around at the divinely appointed pathways that we, were, we will be more open to when we stop, when we listen to God, and we act on what is seemingly just a mustard seed idea that ultimately opens us to a God-sized vision. So this week is week three, Encountering Others, Community living out the call to loving the stranger through active kindness. And I, of course, am excited about this topic as I oversee discipleship here at Smyrna First. So it's always a joy to talk about the importance of community. But I have also found myself challenged by the scripture today because community is different than what I often talk about. And it starts with encounter. About a year ago, Jesse, Josie Kate, our daughter, and I made our way to our every Friday tradition of going to Chick-fil-A. We walked in the door, we went up to the line, ready for our Lord's chicken, knowing that Mr. Jeff, a member here, would be waiting for us at the counter and would ultimately know each of our orders because we go there so often. And as we go down the line, Josie Kate's just looking around because she doesn't have a phone to distract her. And she goes, oh, she's in my class, and just runs over to this table and plops herself down and decides, I'm going to sit with this family today for lunch. 
So Jesse and I order, we awkwardly make our way to the table, and we sit down at the invitation of this family because our little honeybees are so excited that they have encountered each other out of the classroom and in the Chick-fil-A. So we sit down, it's you know awkward as any first time sitting with people would be, and we start to realize that we actually have a good bit in common. Their daughter was born on Josie Kate's due date, so we talked about the struggles of having children who are the youngest in the class and the smallest in the class, but also the joy of how they don't care if the boys who are a year older knock them down, they'll just stand right back up and, well, we're teaching them kindness, so we're telling them not to shove them too. But all that to say, we got to know them. And over the course of, well, now a year, we have gone from an awkward first encounter to developing an actual friendship where almost every Friday we go to Chick-fil-A. But our girls also now play soccer together. And last week I sat with the parents and we talked about our shared church hurt. You know, it starts with encounter. And sometimes it's as simple as that. Today we as a society live in something called the third space, otherwise known as social media. We are overstimulated and curate our lives and our memories to show crafted opportunities, crafted lives, as opposed to picking up our heads and looking around at the world and the people that we see. In Fuel on Friday, which is one of our many groups that we have here, we talked about the struggles with living in this reality and said that we collectively believe we are a society that has a deeper need for connection through social disconnection. Encounter calls us to make space for each other. And the truth is we don't even get to encountering others unless we take Reverend Porter's advice from last week. And we create margins for ourselves and in our calendars to stop and to listen to God. We have to be willing to take the first step though, the first step of encounter before community is even a possibility. Throughout my week, I have tried to be better about picking up my head and looking around. And what I've noticed is that it is often those little children that are the best at this whole encounter thing. You know, they just look at the world around them and they are amazed. One of my favorite things is watching Josie Kate encounter opportunities for the first time encountering people, she just doesn't know a stranger. And while she might sometimes be my greatest frustration, she is often my greatest teacher. The word stranger isn't even in her vocabulary. And so I thought about that and I thought, what flips in us as we grow? Because I remember my parents used to say that, you never knew a stranger when you were young. Well, when I was young. So I do know a stranger now is what I'm hearing. What flipped in me? I don't know if it's life itself or the experience we, experiences that we face as we become more attuned to the pain and the brokenness of the world around us. We no longer encounter others, but we aim to look out for ourselves instead of looking out to see others. But community will never be formed this way. So when do we move in our lives from encounter to evade, from truly seeing one another to literally masking ourselves? Barbara Brown Taylor in her book, An Altar in the World, which is what this whole sermon series is based around, says that hospitality at its core is how we could define encounter. She said that when you break apart the word in Greek, you get philo, love, and Zinnia, stranger. The love of the stranger is encounter. For us, xenophobia, she says, is the world that we live in, fear of stranger. It's no wonder that the Surgeon General has announced that there is an epidemic of loneliness in this world. How we encounter others is developed from how we encounter ourselves. Are we living in the fear of strangers? then we will encounter in fear. If we are living in chaos, 
We won't have time or space or energy to encounter others, or if we do, it will feel very chaotic. But if we're living in joy, we'll encounter others in joy, and we will spread that out. If we encounter through anxiety, our anxious presence will seep into the world and the people around us. Where we are spent is often the first place that we give. Community cannot be formed from our expenditures. Community is formed through the love of stranger, and it begins with encounter. In encounters, we start to not just see others, but we see Christ. Community is formed through showing up. The Gospel of Matthew emphasizes this. God showed up. The incarnation, the word made flesh, Jesus, the one who dwells among us in grace and truth, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus showed up, encountered strangers in love, and formed communities around light and salt and life and everything from the Beatitudes. The scripture for today is Jesus' final discourse in the Gospel of Matthew. And right before it, Jesus prepares the disciples for his upcoming death and resurrection, reminding them that one day he will come again in glory and that God's kingdom will reign. He teaches them the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. He emphasizes the parable of the bridesmaids, which is what we talked about last week. Don't be foolish, be wise. To be wise, you come prepared. And then he moves into the parable of the talents, which is to say, you have worth, you have value, don't hide it. The weight of your value is important. The weight of who you are is important. And here we are now, the love of the stranger. By doing this, by loving the stranger, you will be in right relationship with God and with others. And that is what we are to strive for. Through living a life of mercy, or if you heard my Zacchaeus sermon a few weeks ago, a life of kindness, you will be actively living as salt and light in the world and the communities around us. You see, the Gospel of Matthew was written for a community that had experienced some form of fracture. Identity and lifestyle are incredibly important to this writer, and it emphasizes the importance of living counterculturally. The Jewish readers that the Gospel of Matthew was written for originally were living in a world dominated by Roman elitists, and they considered Rome at that time to be the devil's agent that would one day be overcome. This section of the gospel is specifically establishing what the kingdom of God looks like and emphasizes that loving with our whole heart is centering our willing and our doing around imitating the life of Jesus through deeds of kindness. The call for Jesus followers was to be active and to be faithful in the community and the churches around them. And the characteristic Jesus called them to were inclusion, mercy, love, prayer, missional service, and seeking the purpose of God. And the purpose of God was to love the stranger. This sounds familiar, doesn't it? Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you you who are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Society calls us to individualism, And that third space, social media, just makes it more prevalent. But discipleship, that calls us to community. Are we meeting the needs of our neighbors? We are not called to be self-serving. We are called to be together. What does being together look like? For me, as an extrovert, well, I love this sermon because I love to say, you can find your people. Look around. There are people all around you. Let me help you find a group. I get energy from being surrounded by people. But I grew up with a family full of introverts, so I know that that's not for everyone, that there are some people who say, I get energy from being alone, and that's okay. 
So don't hear this sermon as a sermon saying you have to be in a group. All of us, extroverts and introverts, can hear from this. This is just encountering one another in love and kindness. How do we love the stranger through kindness Christ is calling us to in this scripture? What does this have to do with community? Jesus calls us to the simple things here. You know, I said that I struggled through this sermon. It didn't hit me until, I guess, yesterday when I heard Reverend Hatchell ringing in my ear. Stop overthinking it, Catherine. Stop doing what you do. It is this simple. (laughs) Jesus made it simple so that we can understand it. It's uncalculated. It's accessible. What does it say about me that I was searching for more depth when the answer was crystal clear? Sinago, the Greek word for you welcomed me, you fed me, you watered me, you invited me, you wrapped around me, you showed concern for me, you came to me. This is encounter, this is community, this is love. The story of discipleship here at Smyrna First UMC over the course of the past three years is an incredible story that would take you hours and hours to hear and for me to tell. And so I won't take hours to tell you this because I know that Reverend Porter would get too much joy from me holding you in this room. (laughs) But I will tell you that looking around and thinking back, over the past three years, it's been a story of digging in. It's been a story of encounter. And I've had my hand in it for three years, but let's be honest, it goes way further back than that. From generation to generation, this is a church founded on Christ first, but also rooted in community. We know how to care and love and comfort one another, and that has been happening for a very long time. If you want to know the story of discipleship, I encourage you to walk around during the 10 o'clock hour just to get a small glimpse of it. You'll see generation after generation meeting in different rooms, learning how to do life together. You know, community really did have a comeback after COVID. I think it's because of the global isolation, which I know is part of what's contributing to the loneliness. But we all collectively stopped during COVID, and margin was created for us in our lives, margin that we had never known before. And we really had this opportunity where we learned what love of a stranger looked like, and it looked different than we imagined. It has been small groups for me in experiencing the encounter of God in this comeback from COVID that have shown me what it means to love a stranger. The encounters all started very awkward at first, but as we've grown together, we have experienced this transformation and formation of being a village. We have moved from casual conversation to sometimes in-depth studies, or sometimes just checking in because that's what that group needs. Really, we've learned how to lean on one another. If you were here at the end of August, you heard one of the stories of impact of a community group here. It's the story of the house, as we call it, and the way that strategic placement and divine appointment is literally stitching a family together through a foundational friendship because Discipleship starts simply with friendship. I hope that you will join me in praying for Karen and Dawson, and if you'd like a band, we still have more in the narthex, because this week their kidney surgeries will take place, and Karen will donate her kidney to Dawson, and he will experience what the encounter of loving a stranger looks like and feels like as he has a new approach and encounter with life and with God. And we have all been very, very moved here by that story because we have all experienced the wonder and the awe of how God moves in and through community. It's not how we form it, but it's God who forms it. It's God who does it. From encounter to formation, a village is created and cultivated. Community is the village It begins with first encounter, and sometimes the encounter looks like stress or worry or fear. 
And when you encounter people who are holding that, you often see it in their eyes. But do we pick up our heads from our cell phones? I know that is my struggle. Barbara Brown Taylor said it this way in her book, next time you go to the grocery store, look at the world around you. And when you're standing in the checkout line, don't look at your phone or what's in your cart or your child demanding a sticker, in my case. Look in the eyes of the person checking you out. See the struggle within them as they try to find the broccoli item on the scale. And know that they aren't their struggle, but they are a person that you have just encountered them for who they are and how they need to be seen. And then see them in love. She said, you don't have to be their best friend, but you do need to see them, and they'll see you back. The formation of community is the ability to say, you've never done this before. Let me come alongside you and help you find the way. I know I personally have experienced that here from this community. So for that, I say thank you. Thank you for being my community and helping me find my way when I need it. It is noticing the unspoken or spoken things that we carry and walking alongside each other to help just lighten the load a little bit. What is encounter without seeing and being seen? What is community without encounter and taking it one step further towards bringing goodness to one another? Community is about going together and growing together. But there is a hard question here. And it's this, if we don't see any strangers around us to welcome, are we a community or are we now a clique? Because there is a line. Do you feel the friction here? Friction can be formational. Closed doorness, as I learned this word in a leadership meeting this week, will cause community to crumble. Are we keeping our circles tight or drawing them wide? Are we building a building full of strangers passing in the night? Or are we building and forming communities that simply look around and see each other in love? I've done a lot of research this week through Barna, as Reverend Porter said recently, we are a Barna church. The data, though, is contradictory. We are in an epidemic of loneliness, but we don't make time for community. There's this graphic on the screen, don't worry about the tiny font. That's not what matters right now. Barna's findings suggest that the decisive factor in making time for relationships formed through discipleship is not about who has the hours in the day, but who is willingly creative enough to commit the hours they do have to growing in their faith and equipping others to do it too. So this clock is divided into three sections, and Barna says we divide our lives into time with others, time we have to commit, and time with God. And half of the community who answered this survey, who are all in Christian communities, said that they are just too busy for community. So we are lonely, but we're too busy to change it. Barna also has data for why discipleship community is increasingly difficult to form right now. And there are three reasons that they found. We don't feel good enough. We don't feel like we have enough knowledge. And we don't feel like we are the right person or in the right position for the job. Confidence, thought, opportunity. As I spent time encountering these results among many, I found myself thinking back to the last eight months of discussion I've had the privilege of sitting with leadership in. We've been going through something called Go and Grow Together, which you will start to hear more about. We've been in a phase one launch, but in January, we will full launch three tracks of discipleship mentorship where we're building community around mentoring through careers, through leadership, and through discipleship. And I went through my journal and how we've gone through about 10 chapters together, and I have just been in awe of how I have encountered God through what has been said, and how I have encountered 
the love that we all share for community and commitment to bettering the community. So here are some things that have been said. Community is going out of our circles of comfortability. We will have conflict with this, but in conflicts, we have to navigate life itself. We feel that a lack of friends or a lack of feeling connected is a conflict to why we are part of the half that don't form community. The epidemic of loneliness has not excluded even those who are on teams in their professions or in groups here at the church. We can be a place where connections are formed, where we are a safe and healthy space, and we can come alongside others in helping them find their people and find their place. But the then is now. We are going and growing together, not just to invest in the next generation, but the next century. The Gospel of Matthew reminds us that it isn't about our confidence, our thought, or our opportunity. To act on kindness is as simple as encountering strangers in love. When we do this, we become purposeful people who have purposeful thought and live out purposeful action. Diedrich Bonhoeffer said it this way, love asks for nothing in return, but seeks those who need it. When in our lives did we turn from encounter to evade? When do we begin to isolate ourselves? When did we start masking ourselves for fear that we aren't good enough or fear of the stranger standing next to us? When, our, when in our lives did we start asking for something in return just because we loved you? When did we turn so inward that we forgot to pick up our heads and look out to see those who need our love? Evade is self-serving. Encounter is stranger-serving. And this week, I learned a little bit more about what it means to love a stranger. If you read my letter that got sent out, you'll know a part of this story, but there's more to it. If you didn't read my letter, I'll tell you the full thing. It's often very, very, very cold in our offices, like the Arctic, we like to call it. We feel like penguins sometimes. <laughs> I am um, maybe known for being stubborn on the staff, and so in my, <laughs> trying not to look at Kristen, in my stubbornness, I sat freezing in my office because I didn't want to walk to my car. <laughs> and uh, finally, I gave in. My stubbornness lost and the freezing cold won. And so I started to walk out to my car, but I heard Barbara Brown Taylor ringing in my ear, pick up your head and encounter the world around you. And as I walked outside, I heard the laughter of children. And I turned and looked to my right out in the green space out here. And I saw this group of children running and playing and just having the time of their lives. And I looked a little bit closer and realized that they were playing soccer. And I knew as I was walking to my car, what was in the back of my car? A soccer goal. What were they kicking the ball between? Two little orange cones. Now I had bought the soccer goal to start kicking it with Kat on Wednesday nights where I'm just helping kids learn a little bit more about soccer. And as I saw them playing, this was a moment for me where I thought, you're encountering God right now. This is part of this consolidation. These kids are no longer down the road. They're right here in the yard. Walk out there. And so I went out there and I said, hey, coach, I have this net in my car. I need to buy two, but would you want to share these? But before I could get out to say that, I heard the voice of this little girl. Oh, hey, you can be our ref. Come play with us. Now, I had full dress clothes on. I was wearing heels. I was like, ah, I'll try to play with you. I kicked the ball and almost fell over. So I said, you know what? I'll come back. But it was looking in her eyes where I thought, I'm not encountering you. You just encountered me. You saw me in love. And I felt seen in a way that was new and real to me because I finally got off my phone. So I went back the next day, but I was too late. They were wrapping up their fun time, and so I sat 
my watch to go off when I knew that they would be outside. And I went out there, and once again, she just turned with the brightest look in her eyes. She goes, you came back. You came back. Come play with us. So this time, I was dressed appropriately for soccer, and I started running in the yard with them. And then I uh, bit the dust and a face planted in the grass. <laughs> skinned my hand and my knees, and she was the first one there, and she was like, get up, are you okay, are you okay? And just stood there while I got up, and she just showed me love. She has no idea who I am, but she didn't care, because all it was for her was someone that she could love and be with. I've been so moved by this child, and the presence of the joy that she has in encountering someone just three times. She grabbed my hand and pulled me onto that field, and I thought to myself, I see Jesus in your eyes. But I had to pick up my head to get there. So at least once a week, I will make it my priority to go play soccer with these little kids. Because it is quite simply one way that I can love a stranger. So what is it for you? How can you welcome, feed, water, invite Who can you cover? Who can you show concern for? Who can you go to? As I looked back at the full picture of discipleship over the last three years here, I scrolled through my phone where I just keep a note sheet. Different notes from different community groups, what covenants we set, what different things we were gonna do, how the groups have multiplied. And I saw a note from August 2023 just titled, visioning. It's funny how when we pick up our heads, we Shabbat, we stop, and we turn to God. We see what's been missing for us. That note had three words written on it, and these three words are how I personally intend to live this scripture out. And I invite you to join me in this. Encounter God, experience community, embody love. Jesus says it in his final discourse. He makes it accessible, uncalculated. As a faith community, as disciples of Christ, the purpose God calls us to act upon is this. Love the stranger. In doing so, you will see the face of God.